Welcome to uh, these uh, YOLO talks that we have started. Uh, there were some technical difficulties. I'll just be testing that uh, the second we are online. Uh, okay, perfect. Looks like everything is working smoothly. Welcome to all of you. Uh, we are very lucky to have Professor Anand Kumar with us in the first live session of YOLO Talk. Youth Online Opportunities is a program for young people where we are focusing on uh, creating leaders for tomorrow. And the way we are doing that is helping people during these extremely complex times of the COVID. Uh, sir, uh, many people who are listening to you are members of uh, uh, our YOLO program. And uh, they have been able to help um, people across the country by providing uh, 40,000 families with uh, uh, and individuals with dry ration, uh, saving over 500 lives through blood donation. And uh, today, we are extremely excited to um, have you with us. Uh, we have seen you on television, read your books. There are many IS officers who've been your students. We would like to know um, a lot about your uh, uh, life and activism, which has spanned over six decades. I must say most of the YOLO team members are, uh, uh, you know, around 20 years old. So they haven't even uh, seen many of the times where all of you have worked so hard uh, to bring our democracy to the space we are today. Um, so let's begin from the starting, which is uh, Kashi Vidyapit and Banaras Hindu University, where you were a student and uh, would like you to walk us through those early days when you decided uh, to step into this space of activism and what was your inspiration uh, to uh, you know do social work and work for others i'm very happy to join all of you in this exercise of promoting leadership qualities among the younger people this is a very noble duty in any democracy. We are a young democracy, so it is much more valuable to be able to develop skills of collective functioning and having capacity to take courage for initiative and come forward when others are confused or reluctant to help others. In my case, I was born in 1950, which was the beginning of our freedom journey, our democratic nation building exercise. And it was a time of acute rainfall shortage, third successive year of monsoon failure. You are also helping people with food items and many other essentials of survival. It was a very different situation. It was failure of nature. And there was scarcity all over. And in that period, many of us who were finishing our school, entering university, pre-university course, we were bothered and disturbed, but didn't know what we can do because we thought it's a huge problem of a huge country with so many great leaders and great political parties a very uh, solid government system, media system. So we are tiny little citizens, uh, youngsters. What can we do? Uh, we had our own debating society, cricket club, and other hobby collectives. But we did not have any experience of leadership role. Then there was a call from a body of volunteers in the city they were led by a very eminent freedom fighter who was also known to us because of our proximity in kashi vidya Peet. and they called upon youth and citizens to come forward and donate and collect donations for the needy people in neighboring districts and that excited us there was an invitation and we said okay let us start from the relatively better off part of the city and when I invited a few other friends, not many were very 
happy about it, very confident about it, but few certainly joined. And with two, three other friends, we went out in our bicycles. We didn't have any bag with us because we didn't know that we needed bag if you are collecting food for the needy. But within 24 hours of visiting several households, knocking at the door, pressing the call button, introducing ourselves, and the innocence of our approach, and our being unprofessional convinced many, many the families. Of course, a few said that, well, we, they were not interested, so we must go to the next house. We did that. We didn't feel offended. And within a period of 10 to 12 days, we were able to collect a modest amount of money and some amount of clothes, because these were the two things very much needed. And when we went to approach the chairman of the local citizen relief committee, uh, he was there in a meeting of his executive body and they were very mm -hmm. impressed. They invited us to join the body. 10, 12 elderly people were sitting together. They all were very appreciative because they were discussing shortage of funds. And here we were with a few thousand rupees, which was good enough to uh, get them going. I'm very happy to tell you that that was a very good start. Because from day one, we had positivity in the society because we were not asking for ourselves. We were asking for some others who were needy, genuinely vulnerable. And we were not asking for everything. We were asking for what they can afford to donate. So these two things put together in an atmosphere of national campaign to provide relief to the needy as it is today, we were in the right role at the right time and there was an invitation from the elderly people. So there was also acceptability. We were not barging into others' domain. We were just adding human energy and strength to a national campaign. I must tell you that what you are doing is your entry in a very noble way, selfless way, because there are many kinds of leaders. There are some leaders who are well known for doing their best for the others. There are others who are well known for doing everything, but for their own glamour and glory. These are two broad patterns, selfish people who become leaders with combination of factors and selfless people who become leaders with others' appreciation and approval. I think you are walking in a direction. Uh, we are just... Uh lost the internet connection. Uh, I'm sure Professor Kumar will come back. I see a lot of uh, messages from uh, all of you, uh, really inspiring. Uh, it will be great if you have any questions, please feel free to share them because um, it's a great chance to uh, uh, interact with a scholar and a man from the field uh, who has uh, seen uh, the high tide as well as the low tide, the good times and the bad times in this activist space. And uh, both of them are equally important. Um, something really important for all of us to learn that in this uh, really difficult uh, time and hurdle, there is a great opportunity as well. And uh, working together um, for other people, helping them out is uh, something which you will remember in times to come. Because everybody is going to talk about uh, Corona. Many people will tell you years down the line, oh, I was just at home. Uh, I think Professor Kumar has just uh, joined us uh, in again. Just a second. All right. Looks like the connection is back, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Uh, background is better and connection is also better. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of positive comments coming in our uh, comment box here. Uh, many of your students, many of the participants, uh, uh, who really look up to you uh, are sending in their best wishes and uh, uh, many are sharing to how many people you are an idol. So I was just uh, telling everybody that uh, uh, how uh, amazing it is that uh, we have you uh, with us. And as you told us about the beginning and that first uh, donation drive you went to to collect food even without a bag uh, to uh, where you are today. Uh, we know that uh, there was a major uh, uh, change in your public life 
when you came to uh, BHU and uh, uh, you stepped into student leadership. So would love to know how was that transition <laughs> from uh, going on a bicycle and uh, not carrying a bag to becoming a student leader of one of the most prominent universities of the country. Well, that was again a very fascinating transition because uh, unlike today, uh, those days were very disturbing days for students of our country. Higher education was gradually expanding Students were part of the social elite because maybe five to seven percent people were able to go to higher education beyond high school and intermediate because of poverty, because of lack of resources, because of lack of facilities, many other factors. But our education system was going through a great democratic transition. Seats were few, there were many more who were rejected, and those who were accepted. We're also entering into a uh, endless journey because it was time of educated unemployment. It was time of brain drain. I'm talking about late 60s, 67, 68, 69. So my generation was surrounded by an atmosphere of uh, disenchantment. We were losing faith in our political process, our planning process. Of course, as I told you, the country was not able to feed itself. The country was also not able to educate itself. And of course, the country was shamelessly becoming dependent upon brain drain for the brighter people to get educated and then find a station in life. So when I entered my great university, which was a place of knowledge since 1916, one of the oldest universities in the country, this university itself was trying to find its feet in terms of what to do with syllabus, what to do with the education medium, how to make it more meaningful. And uh, when I entered there, I was a science graduate. A lot of time was spent in laboratories. All my subjects were uh, practical subjects, chemistry, geology, geography. But outside the laboratories, there were students having their own small street corner meetings. There were protest posters on walls of the colleges. And of course, there was national atmosphere of disenchantment. Uh, students were showing black flag to ministers, boycotting their convocation ceremonies, saying that don't give us speeches, give us jobs. So this was time to demand change of education and promotion of employability of educated youths and prevention of brain drain because better talent was running away, seeking shelter in European and American establishments. So all of a sudden, we were in the middle of a protest culture. And I was not much of a protester, but still, uh, as I was interested in public issues, and uh, I was also a debater of my time. So gradually, I got connected with the student activist circles. I also became a member of one of the uh, youth groups called Samajwadi Yuvajan Sabha, which was inspired not by uh, people in power, but people in protest. Dr. Ram Manuel Doria was our icon. And uh, slowly, uh, there was more and more and more protest activities uh, within the campuses, demanding change in education, demanding change in economic policies, and demanding change in the national atmosphere of gloom and hopelessness. Uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the government decided to introduce a bill to change the education system's medium of instruction and make English relatively permanent language as medium of higher education. And as I told you, this was the time of opening of our universities to common people, the rural youth, who were not so well equipped with English language because of their own cultural background. They knew their mother tongue very well. They knew national languages very well, Tamil, Hindi, Bangla, Marathi, but not English so well. They came from rural background, which by definition was not even congenial for learning national languages, not much literacy, not much high school. And I, belonging to uh, this other youth group, which was for promoting Indian languages in education, 
protested against it. And when we took out a rally, we were told not to go to the city. We said, no, it is our city. It is our country. Who are you to stop us? And soon we were pushed into police vans. We were declared hostile and taken to jail. So that was the entry from uh, laboratory to uh, leadership role. Because once you were arrested, uh, coming out after a couple of days, you became known. You became identified as one of the protesting voices of the campus. And students, uh, fellow students, uh, teachers, and the society in general gave you a new label. Are wo netaji ja rahe hain? Kya netaji kya hal hai? Ab agli baar kab jail jaoge? Ab agli baar kab jagra janjat karoge? So uh, it was what you call radicalization of our consciousness, because once you go to jail or once you face police power, you realize the other side of our system, which is of control, authority in a way violence and that makes you more engaged in demanding a better today and a better tomorrow Well, uh, when you are active, you become connected with uh, non-campus life streams, writers, trade union organizers, uh, peasant uh, leaders, of course, social workers, intellectuals. So uh, we like-minded students, not very many, not in hundreds, not even a dozen. Not more than half a dozen were meeting nearly once a week, trying to read some literature, which was about the contemporary times, political, social, and economic problems. We were trying to learn chemistry or uh, uh, Hindi or uh, physics or botany. But now we had to create a space in our own mm -hmm. timetable to learn things beyond our curriculum. And that is very important. More you read, more you learn, more you learn, more clear you become about what is the situation, what is needed to be done. Because at any given time, you have two ways of looking at reality. One is supporting the status quo, that whatever is there is great. You find your own birth in it, your own seat in it. The other opinion is of change and progress. And there they suggest what can be done to make things better. So you have to decide if you are asking for a better tomorrow, then you have to work today for a better tomorrow. And how do you work? First, you work at the level of information and understand. Once you are clear that is it a snake or is it a rope? If it is a rope, it has to be ignored. If it is a snake, then it has to be controlled so that it doesn't bite you and kill you. You don't kill the snake, but you try to improve the situation by controlling the movement of the snake or avoiding the snake. So this is how a group of people develop a common wavelength of understanding, share experiences. But we are not all protest only. We are also sharing time with writers, going to Kavi Sammelan and Mushara. Sometimes Varansi being a city of river and boating, we are also enjoying. Uh, the cultural part of our being young, meaning going to a boat ride, seeing some interesting films together. But even there, you develop an alternative style. All films are not good films. That is your understanding. So, oh, there is a Charlie Chaplin film. We were against imposition of English, but we like to go to a silent movie of Charlie Chaplin made in Hollywood because it was a critical presentation of the realities of modern times or many other films. We were also a generation which was growing up with James Bond films. 
which were not political, but certainly action films. So there is an alternative frame of life from classroom to extracurricular activities. And they are learning through reading, learning through discussion groups, learning through watching film and reading newspapers, listening to leaders becomes your way of educating yourself as a leader in making. Thank you. Thank there you are some that. questions coming in. Uh, Alnika has asked, uh, please uh, tell us about uh, your uh, uh, time in Chicago. As she has just read an article regarding uh, your activism in Chicago. And Afreen Uddin has asked, uh, what is uh, most important for uh, gaining success? Uh, our audience is really young, and uh, as much as they want to be activists, they are also in a time where they are constantly pushed by their parents and society to uh, succeed. So uh, would uh, really like to know about your time in Chicago. Also, for young people, what is um, how do you get success? Or what is this uh, uh, unbelievable, informable word that we are all trying to achieve? Well, uh, the second question first, uh, success is defined and evaluated in terms of your goal. If your goal is that, let me have a good cup of tea. This is an afternoon time. And if you get a good cup of tea with your efforts or with help of others, you are successful. But if you don't get it, then you are unsuccessful. The scale is also very important. If you have modest success, it is ignorable. If it's amazing success, then everybody notices you, like examination. When you have passed, there are a few thousand others who have passed the exam. But if you are in the top five or ten, then that is a, an extraordinary success. Everybody is there in the play field. Everybody is playing together. But the man who scored the goal becomes hero of the evening or heroine of the evening, uh, someone to be talked about. And not others who were there at their position, handled the ball well, cooperated, but they were part of a collective success, not individual success. So you have to be very uh, definite that yes, life is a journey through a mix of failures and successes, but failures must become a stepping stone for success. Otherwise, if you're a series of failures, then you would start disliking yourself, what to talk of others liking you. So you have to be modest in your targets and step by step you will climb even the topmost part of a mountain this is easy saying but very difficult doing but this is the only way to success step by step what you do do with total focus what they call mindfulness if you're doing many things, you're a multitasking person and most of the young people, what to talk of young people, all people are always multitasking. They want to achieve miracles, but there are no miracles in life. Life is like filling a bucket with drop by drop adding of water as it is with the ocean. So the problem with those who are frustrated with life is that there is no miracle. There is no charisma, but charisma is not there in any individual. It is imputed. Others start saying, oh, Kamal kar diya. Oh, Gazab kar diya. But you ask Sachin Tendulkar, every time he puts on pad, he's always nervous what will happen today. And by the end of the day, he says, oh, I played OK. Because he was focused with every ball. And that's why he made another century, or a Virat Kohli, or a film star, or a school teacher, or a homemaker, that today I cooked a good meal is as great as making a century so far as her own target and her own results are concerned. Now, going back to Chicago days, uh, I came from an educated family and I wanted to keep the standards of the family go growing and growing. My mother was a great inspiration because she was uh, uh, not able to complete her studies because of her uh, becoming a mother, particularly for my uh, going, uh, my, my becoming a well cared baby, and of course, my other sisters and brothers. So, 
Uh, target was always to reach the highest level of education, going to the best universities of the country and the world. And therefore, uh, but it happened through accidents because when I was doing my master's at Banaras Hindu University, my leadership role got into confrontation with the vice chancellor and uh, they found us unacceptable. We did a few naughty things also for sure. So we were expelled with the provision of appearing in the examination. And when it was the only window left to go further, I said, I'll do my best. And I became uh, totally absorbed in preparing for the exams, which resulted into a gold medal for me, which made me an expelled gold medalist, one of its kind uh, in the history of my university. And that gold medal carried me further to a higher place, a better place, on the basis of merit of my own uh, learning experiences. At JNU, again, it was a place of very ambitious people. We wanted to be second to none in our generation. So uh, while learning at JNU, we said, what is a much better place than JNU? Probably none at that time in India, but there were few other places around the world. And I targeted to go to the home of learning of sociology. And the first department of sociology was established long back at University of Chicago. It was a well-known university. Uh, even now, it is one of the best universities in the world. And I appeared for a national competition to uh, acquire a scholarship. Uh, luckily for me, uh, I was selected. I won the competition and I was awarded a fellowship to go to study further uh, in any country, in any university of my choice. At Chicago, uh, there was a very strong tradition of studying India as well as the world. And I was very lucky to find some of the best teachers of sociology of that period of mid 70s. And I was able to be there for four years. But unfortunately for me, my activism did not leave me alone even there. Uh, and I became again involved in uh, our uh, community building activities, leadership activities, because India suffered a stroke, a negative stroke in terms of journey of democracy. In our country, democracy was suspended 1975, June. 45 years ago. And as a student who was involved in student political activities in India, I was asked to explain what's going on, how it is going on. I was also part of a movement called Total Revolution Movement before going to Chicago. And that created a small network of students at the University of Chicago. They created a body called Indians for Political Freedom, another body of Indian citizens, Indian diaspora in America created Indians for Democracy. They took me around the United States of America, around 20, 22 universities and colleges. And that made me noticeable. Embassy objected to my traveling around and speaking the truth. And they warned me either you shut up or we cancel your scholarship and put you back into Indian prison. And we said, okay, let us try our luck. They canceled my scholarship. But because I was focused in my studies also, my grades were good. There was a solidarity movement in my university not to allow the government of India to deport me. So they canceled my scholarship. They made me uh, penniless and that stayed for 19 long months. But the university students said that we will not let him go to jail from here. And I got another support from the university. My fellowship was terminated, but they gave me scholar, uh, tuition waiver. And I earned my survival money by becoming a peer and an attendant at uh, uh, odd places, from library to newspapers in the town. And uh, gradually, uh, our network became recognized. And uh, embassy was so shameful about misbehaving with the Indian citizens in India. And an example was how they were misbehaving with the tiny person, a student in America. Uh, soon, emergency was fought back. Uh, there was election in our country where the people who were opposed to emergency were elected to parliament. Some of my leaders, some of my friends were also now ruling the country. And then they restored my scholarship and I got my honor back. 
and my resources and I completed my studies to come back and become a faculty member. I never wanted to be a professional politician and therefore my pursuit of higher education was a guarantee to have an alternative way of living with my convictions and with my activism. I also recommend you to think of your future on the basis of your merit and qualities. Otherwise, politics as profession is a very dicey decision. For a very long time, you look like a parasite and a resourceless person, depending upon patronage of other people who have some resources. And when you get your opportunity in your time, you are also another patron, another dawn, another godfather, which is not a good way of serving the society. Serving the society is to be your duty, citizenship duty. Leadership is a role in a democracy, which is part of our obligation towards our collective. It is not a source of income. So what you did just now in the form of uh, helping the needy was not with the return you got in terms of a, an honorarium or voluntary stipend. It was necessary to meet the logistical requirements, but what you did was invaluable. Is there any price for anybody's donation of his or her blood to a dying man or woman? No price, no money. No money can get you even an ounce of blood. Yes, you got some stipend because you were putting some time which was there for others need. So that's where we have to walk a very clear line, very careful way of doing things. And Chicago days were a reminder that when you are so-called resourceless, there are many more people who may not be able to afford your kind of courage your kind of dedication and your kind of sacrifice of your time, but they compensate you by helping you. So this becomes a team activity. Leadership looks like an individual exercise, but is always a team activity. There are some supporters. There are some role models. There are a few people ahead of you. There are a few people behind you. You look like the leader, but you are part of a chain and be careful to keep the chain strong. Thank you. I think uh, what you just told us in that answer is worth a movie and uh, many of us would be interested in watching it. So I hope uh, because just last night uh, we were interacting with a very special uh, actor, Mr. Adil Hussain, who wanted to be a professor. So maybe we can have a professor on whom a movie is made. Uh, there's an interesting question what you also spoke about by Rosaline Gomez. She says, uh, sir, highlight on the relevance of community leadership amongst youth, since uh, most uh, people listening are young people here, uh, what are your thoughts and ideas around community leadership? That's a very interesting question because uh, uh, when we were growing up, when I was in your age group between 18 and 28, it was a very difficult time when you were claiming attention of the others as a community uh, activist. I don't call it leader, but they consider you as the leader because you are among the very few who are there in the line first. You are among the very few who are facing police or who are collecting donations or putting posters or uh, setting up mat for a public meeting, fixing the mic. Uh, because you are too young to offer any opinion on the basis of your experience. There is hardly any experience behind you. You are in your early 20s or mid 20s. So where is your experience? when? Others are 50 plus, 70 plus. In a country like India, older you are, better suited you are for leadership role. There are 70 plus people who are dominating the parliament of our country, whereas the country is 65% below 35 years of age. So mismatch. But yes, there is age-related power or weightage. And you are too old for the younger people who are the teenagers. They say, oh, go away. It's not your game. You don't understand us. You don't understand our problem, our homework, our tension in the family. So you are adult technically, but you are still caught between two generations 
a very old generation or experienced generation and on the other end very inexperienced generation for whom everything is a magic so to be young and to be a community leader is always a big challenge where you earn the respect of your elders with your modesty you may put your opinion and you add a maybe maybe i am wrong but please hear my perspective also so that makes the older generation to open their eyes and ears to your perspective and then you become included in the process of consultation and maybe your suggested way is everybody's way for tomorrow and when you are approaching the younger people you approach them with respect don't dismiss them because they are too young and they have no experience of ah, i have done all this i have passed my maths exam in high school and i know what it is no please don't do that your wisdom is more important than your experience for the younger people they look at you as ahead of them tomorrow they like to be in your shoes they like to be as confident as you are but they don't want to be bullied because of your few additional years of experience so as you are not very happy with the older people claiming advantage of their experience people younger to you are also in the same mindset they come from the same culture they don't like to be ignored on the basis of age and actually they want to make it a bonus that yes we have to live longer you have borrowed this earth from our generation so don't miss marriage so i suggest you to be very careful because the younger people are always more energetic more idealistic more imaginative but they have to bring both sides together they have to be bridge builder and that's your leadership role you are bridge between the older generation and the younger generation and that scope that function that duty that demand is always there certainly certainly nimisha pande has a really interesting question uh, looking from the perspective that you are also an educationalist have been involved in um, uh, jawaharlal nehru university uh, banaras hindu university uh, talking about education um, she says that we often feel that there is so much deep competition with each other that somewhere we have lost the sensitivity and connection of education with gaining knowledge and rising as more enlightened person what's your view on the present education system well uh, it's a very uh, i must say not very uh, uh, positive evaluation for me though i was lucky to be educated uh, at some of the best universities of our time bhu jnu chicago i was also lucky to have teaching responsibilities 10 years at bhu and 25 years at jnu and maybe another uh, 10 or 12 universities around the world where i was able to go as invited faculty member i must say that we are gradually socializing our students into a culture of fear fear of failure and that makes them vulnerable that makes them control their desire to explore new questions or to interrogate old answers and that's the end of the journey of knowledge you may have your paper collection meaning your degrees but not knowledge knowledge is exploring the unknown in strange ways and that's where fear of failure is one of the biggest problems with our present education which focuses on grades which focuses on certificates which focuses on brand names uh, i am sure that jnu is a brand name but there are many people most of the people uh, who have come to jnu were already educated very well in remote colleges and universities by unknown teachers nameless faces but they gave them the best training in grammar in literature in mathematics in physics in chemistry in economics and that's how they were qualifying in the national competition to co- come to jnu which is one of the best universities uh, even today so i must say that the competition is to be converted into an opportunity of cooperation 
I tell you that uh, in the American universities, which are very competitive, students are going through preliminary examinations for their PhD degrees, not as a loner. They create their own small collective groups. They distribute topics. We used to have our own small study circles, which will meet every evening, two to five hours. We will come prepared with our part of the syllabus present it, discuss it, criticize it, improve it. So collectivity is the essence of your journey of knowledge. You must know by your own experience that you earn the friendship of some of the best people in your own personal life through your school days, your college days. You are competing with each other in sports ground, in a school classroom, but ultimately you were some of the best friends. They were closer to you than your own blood related bonds like your brothers and sisters. They are better than brothers and sisters today in your life because you collected them in a very careful and sensitive manner by helping each other in times of crisis. So today's education system is making us lonely, is making us alienated in search of perfection, in search of success. Success is going to be related with your capacity to connect with each other. Not only your teacher, but also your fellow students, because they're also your silent teachers. I must say that this attitude of fear of failure has to be replaced by dare to adventure, dare to fail. Yes, what worse can happen? Life is not only one time opportunity. This is the wrong philosophy that is now or never. There are very few opportunities or chances now or never. There are always opportunities it's famous uh, that if situations close one door before you there are 99 other doors opening by the side provided you have the courage to look at the options explore the unknown uh, territories and uncharted waters it happened with practically everybody and uh, i tell you as the last point in answer to your question uh, something from einstein einstein said the fishes are not incompetent just because they don't climb the trees like squirrels do. And squirrels are not useless just because they can't swim like fishes. Everybody has something in him or her which deserves attention in times of disappointment, in times of failure, and in times of courage needed to pick up again and start again. So don't dis feel disappointed because of the evaluation of others, maybe that it was the wrong song to sing. The tune was not up to your interest or your capacity, but there are many more tunes which you can sing. Everybody has a drummer whose beats will make you dance, provided you have the courage to listen to that beat, that drummer who suits your temperament or who suits your capabilities. Uh. Thank you. That's uh, amazing. And uh, one of the very interesting questions that came up here was about the role of uh, social media in social change and what are your thoughts about it. And uh, one of our viewers asked us, what do you think about people doing social work and putting it on social media? Uh, back in the day, it was you do social work, but you don't really announce it. Uh, whereas there are lots of activists, um, including Social Media Matters and others who are uh, doing a lot of work and putting it on social media, in fact, doing social work through social media. So what is your opinion about it? It's a very significant question because we are being brought up in a time where we are growing up in a society, but we are made very individualistic. We say it is you who counts. You are the beginning and the end of the story, which is a very wrong training, very wrong lesson. But that's how our personality is being created. Very lonely, very selfish, very self-focused. In these times, we are also suffering with problem of role models. We are told that there is no other way except this selfish careerist journey of your life. So two questions, how to use social media for social change? And second, what to do between your social role and social media. I must say that we are moving from a passive society to an active society. 
they were born as subject country 200 years india was a subject country and even before that it was a caste society it was a gender society so half of the society women were asked to shun initiative stay away stay in parda live in silence live invisible so women have to speak up and come forward people who were victim of caste structure people who were victim of class structure either you were very poor or you were discriminated both ways it was hurting your potential to grow into a full human being needed in the society wanted by the society so we are coming out of that passivity of hundreds of years because of caste system because of gender discrimination because of poverty and because of foreign rule so social work is making yourself enlarge yourself into your total self your total self is connected with many others starting with your own mother imagine if there was no mother where was the possibility of your being there but once you are born you become grow growingly disconnected with those who made your physical existence possible then your teachers your classmates your peer group and then of course your society your culture your community your humanity just because of some carelessness by some people in one part of the world corona virus has attacked all of us so suppose we were irresponsible like the chancellors and allowed things to slip away and not let the others be affected what would have happened with many more experimental centers around the world so i say that two things are needed in india one communicate communicate and communicate so that others become aware about the deficits of our culture and our society and become careful about their ways their language their behavior their attitude their strategy of survival and their definition of success communicate communicate and communicate and therefore i don't like even those who are using uh, social media in a nonsensical manner at least they are coming out of their skin and they are saying something if they say something today which is incorrect they will be able to learn and do things correctly tomorrow but if they are in silence they have no chance of learning and improving so social media is a great engine of change through dissemination of information and ideas imaginations and suggestions and so far as your own role is concerned if you are living a life which is organized around a complexity of personal and collective individual and social let others know it if a great player who has perfected in a game is also a great donor a philanthropist is helping others with diseases with uh, um, destructive natural calamities you realize oh my god he or she is not only a basketball player or a cricket player is also a great human being a film star who is making good dance and good song and making good money because of dance and song if he or she is coming forward in the times of corona virus with a langar or with certain other help then you realize oh that is also another role so we are a social animal let us remember that we our very existence is contingent upon our sociability we must not become totally absorbed in helping the others because help yourself so that you can help others that is the bottom line if i am sick infected by corona virus who will allow me to do help to others no even if i am a doctor i'll be put in quarantine so you have to have a strategy of life of walking on two legs give a strength to yourself cultivate your potential and share your energy your enthusiasm your capacity your uh, possibilities with others who are less privileged who are in need and who deserve your attention oh uh, brilliantly put a very i'll i'll come back to the basics uh, a question where we have based uh, the whole yolo program uh, even before activism uh, our aim is on uh, fun and enjoyment and uh, really having a good time 
while doing activism and activists have somehow been portrayed with these very serious sometimes extremely angry people who are just changing the world but never actually smiling laughing having a good time so <laughs> do you see that there is space to smile when we are working against things like caste system poverty uh, racism discrimination based on gender uh, is it fair that an activist feels happy and smiles and sings is that a part of activism or is it just you know that you have to be serious in in that zone all the time 100% uh, see life is a joyful journey when you are doing your duty towards others it gives you tremendous sense of satisfaction and happiness when you end the day and you look back the last 24 hours you have spent and if you have had a smile on the face of a crying child or if you have extended a helping hand to a needy man or woman you think it was a good day but if you are absorbed in yourself eating drinking sleeping eating drinking sleeping shouting and uh, demanding and feeling frustrated with your unfulfilled desires then you say oh it was a silly day i spent day without any moment of consolation relief joy happiness and that's why people say that listen to yourself the beat of your heart the dream of your mind the sounds which please you the flavor the smell which makes you happy the food which gives you happiness this all is part of your being and your being has to be attended at many levels and that's why uh, people deserve and need some role models look into the biographies of great social reformers they were joyful people look at the dalai lama the first thing he does is to greet you with a smile he can frown because he is living in exile his country is decimated his people are suffering but he has two three layers of his personality and as a human being if he greets another human being with compassion with friendship that's good enough to have a smile though he is in a, uh, in an ocean of tragedy gandhi gandhi was fighting with an empire which was limitless but gandhi will find time to make fun with children he'll have some joyful music out of his prarthana sabha in morning and evening twice a day he'll be singing with others songs written by kabir and tukaram and nanak and jesus and then getting in trance through meditation so that you become modest enough to realize that there is a journey and in journey step by step you are moving forward and in that journey you need to breathe properly uh, feel distress and uh, in many movements uh, poetry is the best instrument rather than long speeches a good music so you see in uh, anti war rallies by thousands of youth in america and europe uh, they will have very few speakers and very many singers and when they go home they are humming a tune which was heard for the first time in the rally and then a bob dylan or a pete seeger is much more powerful for them than a john kennedy or martin luther king same here you have a right to have an alternative culture of music and dance and painting and food and cleanliness and giving a time a share of your time of every day to nature listen to the birds and watch the flowers see the beauty of sunset or sunrise and this all is a gift to you provided you have the eyes and the ears for that don't be too serious don't take things too seriously uh, as it is said dheere uh, dheere re mana dheeraj se sab hoy mali siche sau ghada ritu aaye phal hoy you put lot of water into a plant with your desire to have fruits just by tomorrow no 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 you may add 100 liters of water to a plant of uh, a tree of mango but fruits will come only when the season is right 
it doesn't mean that you become too slow you expedite you become catalyst you become accelerator but don't be impatient there are many factors which make a reality and one of the unknown factors is the force of time the circumstances the conjunction do not ignore the power of conjunction you are one factor there are many more and allow that conjunction to take place and so don't uh, be preemptive is like a, a good batsman who is hitting the ball before the ball is even delivered no wait for the ball to come to you then make a good shot and if you made a good shot you have not made the century you have not won the match but at least for the time being raise your hands and say thank you to yourself and to the competitor that he allowed or she created a situation for a good shot really really important things happen to come in small packages um as we come to the closing uh, because facebook only allows us with an hour uh, <laughs> probably the most important part but sometimes people don't talk about it is honesty and hard work that um, is it even important because sometimes we see in movies you know people come they order beer pizza write a code and next scene they become a millionaire <laughs> or hero is getting beaten up by 20 people gets up has a six pack and muscles and a lot of money so uh, in real life uh, does honesty and hard work play a role i know it's a very stupid questions at times but you should ask stupid questions or uh, should we also be searching for shortcuts as um, you know leaders uh, youth leaders activists whatever you want to call ourselves uh, what was the role of hard work and uh, honesty in your life well i must say that there is not a single example of a successful great leader who did not go through adversities disappointments and failures be it jesus or muhammad or nanak or gandhi or leaders of today there are certainly very glittering glamorous people who are cheats who have been unfair to themselves and others but then they are a short time wonder they don't sustain because truthfulness is one of the essential demands of the society they may be liars they may be pragmatic but they don't want their liar liar the leader to be a liar just like we as sick people may be sick but we don't want to go to a doctor who himself or herself is a sick person so the leader is one step ahead of others in terms of truthfulness honesty sincerity and the capacity to take failures i do believe that no matter how many times we tell each other taking a shortcut is a great temptation and that's a very ordinary mediocre habit of all human beings searching for a shortcut but the straight path is the short shortest cut there is no shortcut to success except hard work and sincerity and honesty people don't like to be reported success where there was failure they like a scientist or a leader who says i tried my best but i have failed let me try again your sincerity will allow you another opportunity do not believe as i said earlier that life gives you only one chance of making admirable performance great success it is step by step including some wrong steps and if you have the courage to tell the truth without losing your focus without allowing your sincerity to be questioned you will get another opportunity honesty is much more valuable than a series of success success is sister or daughter of honesty not the other way down success will not promote honesty 